Hello and welcome to this action-packed first look exploring session. Uh, possibly our final session looking at Every Man Out of His Humour by Ben Johnson for various logistical issues. We may be packing in slightly more text than we normally would do. Um, we're going to see if we can actually complete the text uh, this session, uh, which means we're going to be rattling on at some pace. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to be going in a moment from Act 4, Scene 3 uh, and uh, reading today. Uh, everyone's going to be reading some random parts as well as what we're yeah. saying now. But uh, uh, reading uh, Cordatus and Drora and probably some other people is. I am Eric. Um, yeah, hi. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm on IT support if you, if you need my help. So yeah, I'm here. Uh, have you tried switching on, on off and on again? Uh, reading uh, Fastidious Brisk Deliro and Notary is. Alan, based in Suffolk. Uh, reading Massilente is. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Amisu, and I'm an author based in Romford. Reading Pontarvolo is... Rachel, actor on the East Coast. Uh, reading uh, Midas Shift Haberdasher Groom and George is... Hello, Dan Shirley, hailing from Montpellier, France. Uh, reading Carlo today is... Hi, I'm Lynn Freitas. I'm a college composition teacher. I live in the northwestern United States. Uh, reading Fungoso, Felis, and Saviolina, as well as possibly other people as well, is... Aldi Roberto, academic Tucson. And uh, I am your host, Robert Crichton. Uh, I will possibly be reading a part uh, as well as stage directions. We shall see uh, as we go forward. So without further ado, we're going to dive into Act 4, Scene 3. Um, uh, our, our offstage or onstage uh, commentators, our little mini chorus, have, uh, uh, have pointed out that here comes the night adventurer, as in Act 4, Scene 3. Enter Pontarvolo, a notary servants, and a dog. Don't forget the dog. The dog is very important. And, even more importantly, a cat! <laughs> I wonder, Monsieur Fastidious, comes not. But, notary, if thou please to draw the indentures the while, I will give thee thy instructions. With all my heart, sir. And I'll fall in hand with them presently. Well then, first the sum is to be understood. Uh, good, sir. Next, are several appellations and character of my dog and cat must be known show him the cat sirrah so sir then that the intended bound is the turks court in constantinople the time limited for our return a year and that if either of us miscarry the whole venture is lost these are general conceivest thou or if either of us turn turk aye sir now for particulars, that I may make my travels by sea or land to my best liking, and that hiring a coach for myself, it shall be lawful for my dog or cat or both to ride with me in the said coach. Very good, sir. That I may choose to give my dog or cat fish for fear of bones or any other nutrient or any other nutriment that by the judgment of the most authentical physicians where I travel, shall be thought dangerous. Well, sir. That, after the receipt of his money, he shall neither, in his own person nor any other, neither by direct or indirect means, as magic, witchcraft, or other such exotic arts, attempt, practice, or complot anything to the prejudice, to the prejudice of me, my dog, or my cat, neither shall I use the help of any such sorceries or enchantments as unctions to make our skins impenetrable or to travel invisible by virtue of a powder or a ring or to hang any three forked charm about my dog's neck secretly conveyed into his collar. Understand you? But that all be performed sincerely without fraud or imposture. So, sir? That for testimony of the performance. Myself am to bring thence a Turk's mustachio, my dog's a Grecian hare's lips, and my cat the train or tail of a Thracian rat. Just done, sir. That 
it is said, sir, not done, sir, but forward, that upon my return and landing on the tower wharf with the aforesaid testimony, I am to receive five for one, according to the proportion of the sums put forth. Well, sir. Provided that if before <laughs> our departure or setting forth, either myself or these be visited with sickness or any other casual event, so that the whole course of the adventure be hindered thereby, that then he is to return and I am to receive the prenumerated, the prun prenominated proportion upon fair and equal terms. Very good, sir. Is this all? It is all, sir. And dispatch them, good notary. As fast as it's possible, sir. Exit notary. Enter Carlo. Oh, Carlo. Welcome. Saw you, Monsieur Brisk. Not I. Did he, you, did he appoint you to meet here? I, and I muse he should be so tardy. He is to take an hundred pounds of me in venture, if he maintain his promise. Is his hour past? Not yet, but it comes apace. Tut, be not jealous of him. He will sooner break all the commandments than his hour. Upon my life, in such a case, trust him. Methinks, Carlo, you look very smooth. <laughs> well, I, I came now from a hothouse. I must needs look smooth. From a hot house. Aye, do you make a wonder on it? Why, it is your only physic. Let a man sweat once a week in a hot house and be well rubbed and frotted with a good plump juicy wench and sweet linen, and he shall ne'er have the pox. Why, the French pox. The French pox, out pox. We have them in such good form as they, man. What? Let me perish, but thou art a salt one. Was your new created gallant there with you, Soliardo? <laughs> oh, porpoise, hang him, no. He's a ledger at horns ordinary. Yonder, his villainous Ganymede, and he have been droning a tobacco pipe there ever since yesterday noon. Who? Signor Tripartite, that would give my dog the whiff. Aye, he. They have hired a chamber and all, private, to practice in for the making of the pot patoon and the receipt reciprocal and a number of other mysteries not yet extant. I brought some dozen or twenty gallants this morning to view him as you'd do a piece of perspective in a keyhole, and there he might. And there we might see Soliardo sit in a chair, holding his snout up like a sow under an apple tree, while the other opened his nostril with a poking stick to give the smoke more free delivery. They had split some three or four score ounces between them before we came away. How? Split three or four score ounces? I am preserved it in porringers, as a barber does blood when he opens a vein. Out, pagan. How dost thou open the vein of thy friend? <laughs> friend, is there any such foolish thing in the world, huh? Slid, I never relished it yet. Thy humor is the more dangerous. Hmm, not a wit, senor. Tut. A man must keep time and all. I can oil my tongue when I meet him next and look with a good sleek for it. Twill take all soil of suspicion, and that's enough. When Lynch says, what Lynch says can see my heart. <laughs> Pish, the title of a friend. It's vain, idle thing, only venerable among fools. You shall not have one that has any opinion of wit affected. Act for scene four, enter Deliro and Masalente. How have you, good sir, Pontevalo? Signor Deliro, welcome. Hey, you, sir. Did you see Master Fastidious Brisk? I heard he was to meet your worship here. You heard no figment, sir. I do expect him at every pulse of my watch. In good time, sir. There's a fellow now looks like one of the patricians of Sparta. Marry his wits after ten in the hundred. A good bloodhound, a close-mouthed dog. He followed the scent well. Marry, he's at fault now, methinks. 
I should wonder at that creature is free from the danger of thy tongue. <laughs> oh, I cannot abide these limbs of Satan, or rather Satan, indeed, that will walk like the children of darkness all day in a melancholy shop with their pockets full of blanks, ready to swallow up as many poor unthrifts as come within the verge. Oh, and what hast thou for him that is with him now? <laughs> oh, damn me, immortality. I'll not meddle with him. The pure element of fire, all spirit extraction. How, Carlo? What is he, man? A scholar, Massilente. Do you know him? A rank raw-boned anatomy. He never walked up and down like a charged musket. He walks up and down like a charged musket. No man dares encounter him. That's his rest there. His rest? Why? Is he a forked <laughs> Pardon me, that's to be suspended. You are too quick, too apprehensive. Close, now I think on it. I'll defer it till some other time. Not by any means, Signor. You shall not lose this opportunity. He will be here presently now. Yes, Faith Macalenti, it is best. But look, you, sir, I shall so exceedingly offend my wife with it that... Your wife? Now, for shame, lose these thoughts and become the master of your own spirits. Should I, if I had a wife, suffer myself to be thus passionately carried to and fro with the stream of her humour and neglect my deepest affairs to serve her affections? Slight. I would geld myself first. Oh, but, Signor, had you such a wife as mine is, you would. Such a wife? Now hate me, sir, if either I discerned any wonder in your wife yet with all the speculation I have. I have seen some that have been thought there fairer than she in my time, and I have seen those have not been altogether so tall, esteemed, proper a woman. Women. And I have seen less noses grow upon sweeter faces that have done very well too in my judgment. But in good faith, Signor, for all this, the gentlewoman is a good, pretty, proud, hard favoured thing. Marry not so peerlessly to be doted upon. I must confess, nay, be not angry. Well, sir, how are you pleased to forget yourself? I have not deserved to be thus played upon. And henceforth, Pray you forbear my house, for I can but faintly endure the savour of his breath, my table they, that shall thus jade me for my courtesies. Nay then, Signor, let me tell you, your wife is no proper woman, and by my life I suspect her honesty. That's more, which you may likewise suspect, if you please, do you see? I'll urge you to nothing against your appetite, but if you please, you may suspect it. Good, sir. Exit Delero. Good, sir. Now horn upon horn pursue thee, thou blind, egregious dotard. <laughs> oh, you shall hear him speak like envy. Uh, Monsieur Machelente, you saw Monsieur Brisk lately? I heard you were with him at court. I, Buffone, I was with him. And how is he respected there? I know you'll deal ingenuously ingenuously with us is he made much of amongst the sweeter sort of gallants faith i his kivet and his casting glass have helped him to a place amongst the rest and there his seniors give him good slight looks after their garb smile and salute in french with some new compliment what is this all why say that they should shew the frothy fool such grace as they pretend comes from the heart. He had a mighty windfall of a, out of doubt. Why, all their graces are not to do grace, to virtue or desert, but to ride both, with their gilt spurs quite breathless from themselves. Tis now esteemed precisionism in wit and a disease in nature to be kind towards desert. To love or seek good names? Who feeds with a good name? Who thrives with loving? Who can provide feasts for his own desires with serving others? Ha, ha, ha! Tis folly by our wisest worldlings proved, if not to gain by love, to be beloved. 
How like you him? Is not a good spiteful slave, huh? Shrewd, shrewd. Damn me, I could eat his flesh now. Divine sweet villain. Nay, prithee leave. What's he there? Who? This in the, the starched beard. It's the dull, stiff knight Puntarvalo man. He's to travel now presently. He has a good naughty wit. Marry, he carries little on it out of the land with him. How then? He puts it forth in venture, as he does his money upon the return of a dog and cat. Is this he? Aye, this is he. A good tough gentleman. He looks like a shield of brawn at Shrovetide, out of date, and all and ready to take his leave on a dry pole of ling upon Easter Eve that has furnished the table all lint as he has done the city this last vacation. Come, you'll never leave your stabbing similes. I shall have you aiming at me with them by and by, but... Oh, renounce me then, pure, honest, good devil. I love thee above the love of women. I could even melt in admiration of thee now. Odd so, look here, man. Sir Dragonet and his squire. Act 4, scene 5, enter Sogliado and shift. Save you, my dear Galantos. Nay, hey, come, approach, good cavalier. Prithee, sweet I know this gentleman. He's one that it pleases me to use my good friend and companion, and therefore do him good offices. I beseech you, gentles, know him. I know him all over. Sir, for Senor Soliado's sake, let it suffice. I know you. Why, as I am a gentleman, I thank you, knight, and it shall suffice. Hark you, sir, Puntarvolo, you'd think, you'd little think it, uh, he says, as little piece of flesh as any in the world. Indeed, sir. Upon my gentility, sir, Carlo, a word with you. Do you see that same fellow there? What? Cavalier's shirt. Oh, you know him. Cry you mercy. Before me, I think him the tallest man living within the walls of Europe. <laughs> the walls of Europe. Take heed what you say, Signor. Europe's a huge thing within the walls. Lieutenant Twer is huge again. I justify what I speak. Slid, he swaggered even now in a place where we were. I never saw a man do it more resolute. <laughs> Nay, indeed. Swaggering is a good argument of resolution. Do you hear this, Signor? Aye, to my grief. Oh, that such muddy flags for every drunken flourish should achieve the name of manhood, whilst true perfect valour, hating to shew itself, goes by despised. Heart, I do know now, in a fair just cause, I dare do more than he a thousand times. Why should not they take knowledge of this, ha, and give my worth allowance before his? Because I cannot swagger. Now, the pox light on your picked hatch prowess. Why, I tell you, sir, he has been the only bid stand that has ever kept Newmarket, Salisbury Plain, Hawks, Hockley, the whole Gads Hill, and all the high places of any request. He has had his mares and his geldings. He have been worth 40, three score, a hundred pound a horse would have sprung you over the hedge and ditch like your greyhound. He has done 500 robberies in his time, more or less, I assure you. What? And escaped? Escaped? To faith, I He has broken the, gale, the jail when he's been in irons and irons and been out and in again and out and in 40 times and so few, not so few he. A fit trumpet to proclaim such a person. But can this be possible? Pardon me, my dear Orestes, causes have their quidditch until ill jest is ill jesting with bell ropes. How? Pilates and Orestes. Ay, he's my Pilates and I'm his Orestes. How like you the conceit? Oh, it is an old stale interlude device. No, I'll give you names myself. Look you, he shall be your Judas and you shall be his elder tree to hang on. Nay, rather let him be Captain Pod. And this his motion, for he does nothing but shoe him. <laughs> Excellent. Or thus, you shall be holden, and he your camel. Do not mean to ride, gentlemen. Faith, let me end it for you, Gallant. 
you shall be his countenance, and he your resolution. Truth, that's pretty. How say you, Kepler? Shall it be so? Ay, ay, most voices. Faith, I am easily yielding to any good impressions. Then give hands good resolution. Match, he cannot say good countenance now properly to him again. Yes, by an irony. Oh, sir, the countenance of resolution should, as he is, be altogether grim and unpleasant. And act four, scene six, enter fastidious brisk. Good hours make music with your mirth, gentlemen, and keep time to your humours. How now, Carlo? Monsieur Brisk, many a long look have I extended for you, sir. In good faith, I must crave pardon. I was invited this morning, ere I was out of my bed, by a bevy of ladies to a banquet. Whence it was almost one of Hercules' labours for me to come away. <laughs> the respect of my promise did so prevail with me. I know they'll take it very ill, especially one that gave me this bracelet of her hair, but overnight. And this pearl another gave me from her forehead. Marry she. What? Are the writings ready? I will send my man to know. Sirrah, go you to the notaries and learn if he be ready. Leave the dog, sir. Exit servant. And how does my rare qualified friend Soriado? Oh, Signor Macalenti, by these eyes I saw you not. I'd saluted you sooner or else, I'm a troth. I hope, sir, I may presume upon you that you will not divulge my late check or disgrace, indeed, sir. You may, sir. He knows some notorious jest by this gull that hath him so obsequious. Monsieur Fastidious, uh, do you see this fellow there? Does he not look like a clown? Would you think there were anything in him? Anything in him? Beshrew me. Ay, the fellow hath a good, ingenious face. Why, this element, he's an, in, as ingenious a tall man as ever swaggered about London. He and I call countenance and resolution, but his name is Cavalier Schiff. Cavalier, you knew Signor Clog. That was hanged for robbery at Harrow on the Hill. Knew him, sir. Why, it was he gave all the directions for the action. How? Was it your project, sir? <clears throat> Pardon me, countenance. You do me some wrong to make occasions public, which I imparted to you in private. God's will. Here are none but friends resolution. That's all one. Things of consequence must have their respects where, how, and to whom. Yes, sir. He showed himself a true clog in the coherence of that affair, sir. For if he had managed matters as they were corroborated to him, it had been better for him by a 40 or 50 score of a pound, sir. And he himself might have lived in despite of fate to have fed on woodcocks with the rest. But it was his heavy fortune to sink poor clog and therefore talk no more of him. Why, had he more aiders then? Oh, Lord, sir, aye, there were some present there that were the nine worthiest to him in the faith. Aye, sir, I can satisfy you at more convenient conference, but for my own part, I have now reconciled myself to other courses and profess a living out of my other qualities. Nay, he's left old now, I assure you, and is able to live like a gentleman by his qualities. By this dog, he has the most rare gift in tobacco that ever you knew. He keeps more ado with this monster than ever Banks did with his horse or the fellow with the elephant. He will hang out his picture shortly in a cloth you shall see. Oh, he does manage a quarrel the best that ever you saw for terms and circumstances. Good face, senor. Now you speak of a quarrel, I'll acquaint you with the difference that happened between the gallant and myself. Sir Pontevallo, you know him. If I should name him, senor... Lucilento. Lucilento? What inauspacious chance interposed itself to your two loves? Faith, sir, the same that sundered Agamemnon and great Thetis' son. But let the cause escape, sir. He sent me a challenge, mixed with some few braves, which I restored, and in fine, we met. Now, indeed, sir, I must tell you, he did offer at first very desperately, but without judgment. 
For, look you, sir, I cast myself into this figure. Now he comes violently on, and withal advancing his rapier to strike, I thought I took his arm, but he had left his whole body to my election, and I was sure he could not recover his guard. Sir, I missed the purpose in his arm, rashed his doublet sleeve, ran him close by the left cheek, and threw his hair. He again lights me here. I had my gold cable hat band, then new come up, which I wore about a murie French hat I had. Cuts my hat band, and yet it was massy goldsmith's work. Cuts my brims, which by good fortune, being thick embroidered with gold twists and spangles, disappointed the force of the blow. Nevertheless, it grazed on my shoulder. Takes me away six pearls of Italian cutwork band I wore. Cost me three pound in exchange, but three days before. This was a strange encounter. Nay, you shall hear, sir. With this, we both fell out and breathed. Now, upon the second sign of his assault, I betook me to the former manner of my defence. He, on the other side, abandoned his body to the same danger as before, and follows me still with blows. But I, being loath to take the deadly advantage that lay before me of his left side, made a kind of stromazoon, ran him up to the hilt through, my, through the doublet, through the shirt, and yet missed the skin. He, making a reverse blow, falls upon my embossed girdle. I'd thrown off the hangers a little before, strikes off the skirt of a thick lace satin doublet I had, lined with four taffetas, cuts off two panes embroidered with pearl, rends through the drawing outs of tissue, enters the linings and skips the flesh. I wonder he speaks not of his wrought shirt. Here, in the opinion of mutual damage, we paused. But ere I proceed, I must tell you, Signor, that in this last encounter, not having leisure to put off my silver spurs, one of the rowels catched hold of the ruffle of my boot, and being Spanish leather and subject to tear, overthrows me, rends me two pair of silk stockings that I'd put on, being somewhat raw morning, a peach colour and another, and strikes me some half inch deep into the side of the calf. He, seeing the blood come, presently takes horse and away. I, having bound up my wound with a piece of my raw shirt. Oh, it comes in there. Read after him, and lighting at the court gate, both together, embraced, and marched hand in hand up into the presence. Was not this business well carried? Well, yes, and by this we can guess what apparel the gentlemen wore. For valour, it was a designment begun with much resolution, maintained as much, maintained with as much prowess, and ended with more humanity. Re-enter the servant. How now? What says the notary? He says he is ready, sir. He stays but your worship's pleasure. Come, we will go to him, monsieur. Gentlemen, shall we entreat you to be witnesses? You shall entreat me, sir. Come, Resolution. I follow you, good countenance. Uh, come, Signor, come, come. And oh. exit all except for Basilente. Oh, that there should be fortune to clothe these men so naked in desert, and that the, storm, the just storm of a wretched life beats them not ragged for their wretched souls, and since as fruitless, even as black as coals. And exit Masalente, leaving us with our chorus. Why, but senior, how comes it that Fungoso appeared not with his sister's intelligence to brisk? Marry, long of the evil angels that she gave him, who have indeed tempted the good, simple youth to follow the tale of fashion, and neglect the imposition of his friends. Behold, here he comes, very worshipfully attended and with good variety. 
Uh, and uh, yes, we have uh, Act 4, Scene 7, um, with the return of Fungoso, uh, the chorus having uh, said, oh, there was a plot hole, why didn't this thing happen? No, 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 you just weren't paying attention. Um, uh, we go into Act 4, Scene 7, uh, with Fungoso in a new suit, followed by his tailor. I had just assigned the tailor to someone who can't, it can't be, so it has to be somebody else. Bryony, are you free? I think you probably are. Be the tailor, please. Um, we have a shoemaker who hopefully doesn't say anything, and a haberdasher who is assigned. So, scene with Fungoso, take it away. Gramercy, good shoemaker. I'll put to strings myself. Exit shoemaker. Now, sir, let me see. What must you have for this hat? I, here's a bill, sir. How does it become me? Well, Excellent, sir. As ever you had any hat in your life. Nay, you'll say so all. I, in face, sir, a hat as good as any man in this town can serve you and will maintain fashion as law. Yeah, trust me for a grow else. Does it apply well to my suit? Exceedingly well, sir. How like is thou my suit, Haberdasher? Oh, my troth, sir, tis very well, really well made. I never saw a suit sit there, I can tell all. Nay, we have no art to please our friends, we. Here, Haberdasher, tell the same. And give some money. Yeah, oh, face, sir, it makes you have an excellent body. Nay, believe me, I think I have as good a body in clothes as another. You lack points to bring your apparel together, sir. I'll have points in none. How now? Is it right? Why, it fate, sir, tis too little. But upon father hopes, good morrow to you, sir. And exit the haberdasher, uh, standing by to uh, bring in the chorus again. Farewell, good haberdasher. Well now, Master Snip, let me see your bill. He thinks he discharges his father was too thick. Oh, therein he saucily imitates some great men. I warrant you, though he turns off them, he keeps this tailor in place of a page to follow him still. This bill is very reasonable in faith. Hark you, Master Snip. Troth, sir, I am not altogether so well furnished at this present as I could wish I were, but if you'll do me the favor to take part in hand, you shall have all I have by this hand. Sir. And but give me credit for the rest till the beginning of the next term. Oh, Lord, sir. For God, and by this light, I'll pay you to the utmost and acknowledge myself very deeply engaged to you by the, by the courtesy. Why, how much have you there, sir? Mary, I have here four angels and 15 shilling of white money. It's all I have, as I hope to be blessed. You will not fail me at the next term with the rest. No, and I do pray heaven I be hanged. Let me never breathe again upon this mortal stage, as the philosophers call it, by this air, and as I am a gentleman, I'll hold. He were an iron-hearted fellow in my judgment that would not credit him upon his this volley of oaths. Well, sir. I'll not stick with any gentleman for a trifle. You know what his remains. Aye, sir, and I give you thanks in good faith. Oh, fate, how happy I am made in this good fortune. Well, now, I'll go seek our monster brisk. Odd so, I have forgot ribbons for my shoes and points. Slid, what luck's this? How shall I do? Master Snip, pray, let me reduce some two or three shillings for points and ribbons as i am an honest man i have utterly disfranched myself in the default of memory pray let me be holding to you it shall come home in the bill believe me faith sir i can hardly depart with ready money but i'll take up and send you some by my boy presently what colored ribbon would you like would you have what what you shall think beat in your judgment sir to my suit well, I'll send you some presently. And points too, sir? And points too, sir. Good Lord, how shall I study to deserve this kindness of you, sir? 
Pray, let your youth make haste, for I should have done a business an hour since, that I doubt I shall come too late. Exit the tailor. Now in good faith I am exceeding proud of my suit. Do you observe the plunges that this poor gallant is put to, Signor, to purchase the fashion? Aye. To be still a fashion behind with the world, that's the sport. Stay. Oh, here they come from sealed and delivered. So, from uh, Fungoso's uh, not so successful uh, uh, accoutrement session, uh, we go to Act Four, Scene Eight. Enter Pontarvolo, fastidious, brisk in a new suit. Uh, Fungoso is, as ever, behind the curve, and servants with the dog. Well, now my whole venture is forth. I will resolve to depart shortly. Hey, Sir Pontarvolo, go to the court and take leave of the ladies first. I care not, if it be this afternoon's labour. Where's Carlo? Here he comes. And enter Carlo, Sogliado, Shift and Massalente. Faith, gallants, I am persuading this gentleman to turn courtier. He is a man of fair revenue, and his estate will bear the, cha the charge well. Besides, for his other gifts of the mind or so, why, they are as nature lent him them, pure, simple, without any artificial drug or mixture of these two threadbare beggarly qualities, learning and knowledge, and therefore the more accommodate and genuine. Now, for the life itself... Oh, the most celestial and full of wonder and delight that could be imagined, Signor, beyond thought and apprehension of pleasure. A man lives there in a divine rapture, and he will think himself in the ninth heaven for the time, and lose all sense of mortality whatsoever, when he shall behold such glorious and almost immortal beauties, hear such angelical and harmonious voices, discourse with such flowing and ambrosial spirits, whose wits are as sudden as lightning and as humorous as nectar. Oh, it makes a man all quintessence and flame and lifts him up in a moment to the very crystal crown of the sky, where, hovering in the strength of his imagination, he shall behold all the delights of the Hesperides, the Insulae Fonatae, Adonis Gardens, Tempe, or whatever else, confined within the amplest verge of Percy, to be mere umbre and imperfect figures conferred with the most essential felicity of your court. Well, this iconium was not extemporal. It came too perfectly off. Besides, sir, you shall never go, you shall never need to go to a hothouse. You shall sweat there with courting your mistress or losing your money at Primero, as well as in the stoves in Sweden. Mary, this, sir, you must ever be sure to carry a good strong perfume about you that your mistress's dog may smell you out amongst the rest. And in making love to her, never fear to be out, for you may have a pipe of tobacco or a base vial shall hang on the wall of purpose you will will put you in presently the tricks your resolution has taught you in tobacco the whiff those slights will stand you in very good ornament there aye to some perhaps but he should come to my mistress with tobacco this gentleman knows she'd reply upon him your face Oh, by this bright sun, she has the most acute, ready and facetious wit that there's no spirit able to stand her. You can report it, Signor. You have seen her. Then can he report no less out of his judgment, I assure him. Oh, I like her well enough, but she's too self-conceited, methinks. Ah, indeed, she's a little too self-conceited. And were not for that humour, she were the most to be admired woman, lady in the world. Indeed. It is a humour that takes from her other excellences. Why? It may easily be made to forsake her, in my thought. Easily, sir? Then are all impossibilities easy. You conclude too quick upon me, signor. What will you say if I make it so perspicuously appear now that yourself shall confess nothing more possible? Marry, I will say I will both applaud and admire you for it. 
and I will second him in the admiration. Why, I'll show you, gentlemen. Carlo, come hither. And enter Massalente, uh, oh no, Massalente, Carlo, Pantovello, and a fastidious brisk whisper together. Good faith, I have a great humor to the court. What, what thinks my resolution? Shall I adventure? Troth, countenance, as you please. The place is a place of good reputation and capacity. Oh, my tricks in tobacco, as Carlo says, will show excellent there. Why, you may go with these gentlemen now and see fashions, and after, as you shall see, correspondence. You say true. You will go with me, Resolution? I will meet you, Countenance, at a, about three or four o'clock. But to say to go with you, I cannot. For, as I am Apple John, I am to go before the cockatrice you saw this morning, and therefore pray, present me excused, good Countenance. Farewell, good Resolution, but fail not to meet. As I live. And exit shift. Admirably excellent. If you can but persuade Soliado to court, there's all now. Oh, let me alone. That's my task. Now, by my by wit, Macalente, it's above measure excellent. It will be the only court exploit that ever proved courteous, courtier and genius. Upon my soul. It puts the lady quite out of her humor, and we shall laugh with judgment. Come, the gentleman was of himself resolved to go with you afore you moved it. Why then, gallants, you two and Carlo go forth to prepare the jest. Soliardo and I will come some while after you. Uh, pardon me, I am not for the court. That's true. Carlo comes not at court indeed. Well, you shall leave it to the faculty of Monsieur Brisk and myself. Upon our lives, we will manage it happily. Carlo shall bespeak supper at the Mitre against we come back, where we will meet and dimple our cheeks with laughter at the success. Aye, but will you promise to come? Myself shall undertake for them. He that fails, let his reputation lie under the lash of thy tongue. Odd so. Ah, look who comes here. Enter Fungoso. What, nephew? Uncle, God save you. Did you see a gentleman, one Monsieur Brisk, a courtier? He goes in such a suit as I do. Here's the gentleman, nephew, but not in such a suit. Another suit? How now, nephew? Would you speak with me, sir? Aye, when he has recovered himself, poor Paul. Some Rosa Salis. How now, Signor? I am not well, sir. Why, this it is to dog the fashion. Nay, come, gentlemen, remember your affairs. His disease is nothing but the flux of apparel. Sirs. Return to the lodging. Keep the cat safe. I'll be the dog's guardian myself. And exuant uh, servants to guard the cat. <laughs> <laughs> Nephew, will you go to court with us? These gentlemen and I are for the court. Uh, nay, be not so melancholy. Slid, I think no man in Christendom has that rascally fortune that I have. Hey, you suit is, your suit is well enough, signor. Nay, not for that, I protest. But I had an errand to Monsieur Pastidius, and I have forgot it. Why, go along to court with us and remember it. Come, gentlemen, you three take one boat, and Soliardo and I will take another. We shall be there instantly. Content, good sir. About safe as your pleasure. Farewell, Carlo. Remember. I warrant you. Would I had one of Kemp's shoes to throw after you. Good fortune will close the eyes of our jest. Fear not. And we shall frolic. And they exit, leaving us with a chorus. This Massalante, senor, begins to be more sociable all of a sudden, methinks, than he was before. There's some portent in it, I believe. Oh, he's a fellow of a strange nature. 
Now does he, in this calm of his humour, plot and store up a world of malicious thoughts in his brain, till he is so full with them that you shall see the very torrent of his envy break forth like a land flood, and against the course of all their affections oppose itself so violently that you will almost have to wonder, have wonder to think how it is possible the current of their disposition so, shall receive so quick and strong an alteration. Aye, Mary, sir, this is that on which my expectation has dwelt all this while. For I must tell you, Signor, though I was loath to interrupt the scene, yet I made it a question in mine own private discourse how he should properly call it every man out of his humor, when I saw all his actors so strongly pursue and continue their humors. Why, therein his art appears most full of luster, and approacheth nearest the life, especially when in the flame and height of their humors they are laid flat, it fills the eye better and with more contentment. How tedious a sight were it to behold a proud, exalted tree kept and cut down by degrees, when it might be felled in a moment, and to set the axe to it before it came to that pride and fullness were as not to have it grow. Hmm. Well, I shall long till I see this fall you talk of. To help your longing, Signor, let your imagination be swifter than a pair of oars, and by this, Suppose Puntavolo, Brisk, Fungoso, and the dog arrived at the court gate and going up to the great chamber. Massalente and Sogliardo will leave them on the water till possibility and natural means may land them. Here come the gallants, now prepare your expectations. And we're into Act 5, Act 5, Scene 1, Enter Pontavolo with his dog, followed by Fastidious, uh, Brisk, and Fungoso. Come, gentle signor, you are sufficiently instructed. Who, oh, I, sir? No, this gentleman. But stay, I take thought how to bestow my dog. He is no competent attendant for the presence. Yes, that's true indeed, knight. You must not carry him into the presence. I know it, and I, like a dull beast, forgot to bring one of my cormorants to attend me. Why, you are best to leave him at the porter's lodge. Not so. His worth is too well known amongst them to be forthcoming. Slight, how will you do then? I must leave him with one that is ignorant of his quality, if I will have him to be safe. And see, here comes one that will carry coals, ergo, will hold my dog. and enter a groom with a basket. My honest friend, may I commit the tuition of this dog to thy prudent care? You may, if you please, sir. Pray thee, let me find thee here at my return. It shall not be long till I will ease thee of thy employment and please thee. Forth, gentles. Why, but will you leave him with so slight command? If you use no more charge upon the fella. Charge? No. There were no policy in that. <coughs> that were to let him know the value of the gem he holds, and so to tempt frail nature against her disposition. No. Pray thee let thy honesty be sweet, as it shall be short. Yes, sir. But hark you, gallants, and chiefly, Monsieur Brisk, when we come in eye shot, or presence of this lady, let not other matters carry us from our project. But, if we can, single her forth to some place. I that... warrant you. And be not too sudden, but let the device indulge itself with good circumstance. On. Is this the way? Good truth. Here be fine hangings. Exuant Pontalvolo, fastidious brisk and fungoso, the groom remains. Honesty, sweet and short. Mary, it shall, sir, doubt you not. For even at this instant, if one would give me twenty pounds, I would not deliver him. There's for the sweet. But now, if any man come offer me but two pence, he shall have him. There's for the short now. Sid, 
What a mad humorous gentleman is this to leave his dog with me. I could run away with him now, and he were worth a thing, anything. Enter Massalinta and Sogliado. Come on, signor. Now prepare to court this all-witted lady, most naturally, and like yourself. Faith, and you say the word, I'll begin to her in tobacco. Oh, fie on it. No, you shall begin with, how does my sweet lady? Or, why are you so melancholy, madam? Though she be very merry, it's all one. Be sure to kiss your hand often enough. Pray for her health and tell her how more than most fair she is. Screw your face at one side thus and protest. Let her fleer and look askance and hide her teeth with her fan. When she laughs a fit to bring her into more matter, there's nothing, that's nothing. You must talk forward, though it be without sense, so it be without blushing. Tis most court-like and well. But shall I not use tobacco at all? Oh, by no means. Twill but make your breath, breath suspected, and that you use it only to confound the rankness of that. They all be advised, sir, by my friends. Odds my life. See where Sir Pantavalo's dog is. I would the gentleman would return for his follower here. I'll leave him to his fortunes else. Twere the only true jest in the world to poison him now, ha! By this hand I'll do it, if I could get him off the fellow. Signor Soliardo, walk aside and think upon some device to entertain the lady with. So I do, sir. Walks off in a meditating posture. How now, mine honest friend? Whose doorkeeper art thou? Doorkeeper, sir. I hope I scorn that to faith. Why? Dost thou not keep a dog? Sir, now I do. Now I do not. I think this would be sweet and short. Make me his dog keeper. Exit groom. This is excellent, above expectation. Nay, stay, sir. Seizing the dog. You'd be travelling, but I'll give you a dram shall shorten your voyage here. And gives him poison, yes. Oh, sorry, these are quite important stage directions, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, sir, I'll be bold to take my leave of you. Now to the Turk's court in the devil's name, for you shall never go a god's name. And kicks him out. Sodliado, come. I have it in faith now. We'll, we'll sing it. Take heed you lease it not, senor. Ere you come there, preserve it. And exuant, leaving us with the chorus. How like you this first exploit of his? <sighs> A piece of true envy. But I expect the issue of the other device. Here they come that will make it appear. Act 5, scene 2. Enter Saviolina, Pantovaro, Fastidious Brisk and Fongoso. Why, I thought, sir, Pantovalo, you had been gone your, your voyage. Dear and most amiable lady, your divine beauties do bind me to those offices that I cannot depart when I would. Tis most court-like spoken, sir, but how might we do to have a sight of your dog and cat? This dog is in the court, lady. And not your cat? How dare you trust her behind you, sir? Troth, madame, she hath sore eyes, and she doth keep her chamber. Mary, I have left her under sufficient guard. There are two of my followers to attend her. I'll give you some water for her eyes. When do you go, sir? Certes, sweet lady, I know not. He does stay the rather, madam, to present your acute judgment. With so courtly and well-parted a gentleman, as yet your ladyship hath never seen. What is he, gentle Monsieur Brisk? Not that gentleman? Pointing at Fungoso. No, lady, this is a kinsman to Justice Silence. Pray, sir, give me leave to report him. He's a gentleman, lady, of that rare and admirable faculty, as I protest I know not his like in Europe. He's exceedingly valiant, an excellent scholar, and so exactly travelled 
that he is able in discourse to deliver you a model of any prince's court in the world speaks the languages with that purity of phrase and facility of accent that it breeds astonishment. His wit, the most exuberant and above wonder pleasant of all that ever entered the concave of this year. Tis most true lady, Mary is no, is no such excellent proper man. His travels have changed his complexion, madame. Oh, sir, Pantarello, you must think every man was not born to have my servant Brisk's feature. But that which transcends all, lady, he doth so peerlessly imitate any manner of person for gesture, action, passion, or whatever. Aye, especially a rustic or a clown, madam. It is not possible for the sharp, sharpest sighted wit in the world to discern any sparks of the gentleman in him when he does it. Oh, Monsieur Brisk, be not so tyrannous to confine all wits within the compass of your own. Not find the sparks of a gentleman in him, if he be a gentleman. Not in truth, sweet lady, I believe you cannot. That's me. <laughs> Oh, well, bit of talking to yourself. It's fine. <laughs> Do you believe so? Why? I can find sparks of a gentleman in you, sir. Aye, he is a gentleman, madame, and a reveler. No, in truth, sweet lady, I believe you cannot. Do you believe so? Why? I can find sparks of a gentleman. Oh, wait, I, I've lost my spot, right? Or is it the text? Uh, indeed, I think. Indeed, I think. I have seen your ladyship at our rebels. Like enough, sir, but would I might see this wonder you talk of? May one have a sight of him for any reasonable sum? Yes, madame. He will arrive presently. What, and shall we see him clown it? Yeah, faith, sweet lady, that you shall. See, here he comes. Enter Massalente and Sogliardo. This is he. Pray observe him, lady. Beshrew me, he clowns it properly indeed. Nay, mark his courtship. How does my sweet lady? Hot and moist? Beautiful and lusty? <laughs> Beautiful and it pleased you, sir, but not lusty. Oh, oh, lady, it pleased you to say so in truth. And how does my sweet lady in health? Buona roba, quest o quere novelis, quere novelis, sweet creature. Oh, excellent. Why, gallants, is this he that cannot be deciphered? They were very blear-witted in faith that could not discern the gentleman in him. But you do, in earnest, lady. Do I, sir? Why, if you had any true court judgment in the carriage of his eye and in the inward power that forms his countenance, you might perceive his counterfeiting as clear as the noonday. Alas, nay, if you would have tried my wit indeed, you should never have told me he was a gentleman, but presented him for a true clown indeed, and then have seen if I could have deciphered him. Oh, God, her ladyship says true, knight. Does he not affect the clown most naturally, mistress? Oh, she cannot but affirm that out of the bounty of her judgment. Nay, out of doubt he does well for a gentleman to imitate. But I warrant you, he comes, he becomes his natural carriage of the gentleman much better than his clownery. It is strange in truth her ladyship should see so far into him. Aye, is it not? Faith, as easily as may be, not to cipher him, quoth you. Good sadness, I wonder at it. Why? Has she deciphered him, gentlemen? Oh, most miraculously and beyond admiration. Is it possible? She has gathered the most infallible signs of the gentleman in him, that's certain. Why, gallants, let me laugh at you a little. Was this your device to try my judgment in a gentleman? Nay, lady, do not scorn us, though you have this gift of perspicacy above others, 
What if he should be no gentleman now, but a clown indeed, lady? How think you of that? Would not your ladyship be out of your humour? Oh, but she knows it's not so. What if he were not a man, you may as well say. Nay, if your worships could gull me, so indeed you were wiser than you are taken for. In good faith, lady, he's a very perfect clown, both by father and mother, that I'll, that I'll assure you. Oh, sir, you are very pleasurable. Nay, do but look on his hand, and that shall resolve you. Look, you lady, what a palm here is. That, that was holding, that was withholding the plow. The plow? Did you discern any such thing in him, madam? Faith, no, she saw the gentleman as bright as noonday. She deciphered him at first. Troth, I am sorry your ladyship's sight should be so suddenly struck. Oh, you are good beagles. What? Is she gone? Hey, stay, sweet lady. Kinovillas, Kinovillas. Out, you fool, you. She's out of her humor and faith. Yes, so, uh, talking, talking to yourself again, because uh, uh, exit Savalina in uh, anger and Fungoso says uh, she's out of her humor and faith. Yes. Nay, let's follow it. Walt is hot, gentlemen. Come. Um, on mine honour, we shall make her blush in the presence. My spleen is great with laughter. Your laughter will be a child of a feeble life, I believe, sir. Come, signor, your looks are too de dejected, methinks. Why mix you not mirth with the rest? Odds will, this suit frets me at the soul. I'll have it altered tomorrow, sure. And they exit. Act five, scene three, enter shift. I am come to the court to meet with my countenance, Sogliardo. Poor men must be glad of such countenance when they can get no better. Well, need may insult upon a man, but it shall never make him despair of consequence. The world will say, tis base, <sighs> tosh, base. Tis base to live under the earth, not base to live above it by any means. And enter fastidious brisk, uh, Pontavolo, Sig Sogliardo, Fungoso, and Massalente. The poor lady is most miserably out of her humour, in faith. There was never so witty a jest broken. At the tilt of all the court, wits christened. Oh, this applause taints it foully. I think I did my part in courting. Oh, resolution. I mean my dog. Where is he? It's precious. Go seek for the fellow, good signor. Exit Fungoso. Here. Here I left him. Why? None was here when we came in now, but Cavalier's shirt. Inquire of him. Did you see Sir Pontevalo's dog here, Cavalier, since you came? His dog, sir? He mean to look his dog, sir. I saw none of his dog, sir. Upon my life, he has stolen your dog, sir, and been hired to it by some that have ventured with you. You may guess by his peremptory answers. Not unlike... For he hath been a notorious thief by his own confession. Sirrah, where is my dog? Charge me with your dog, sir. I had none of your dog, sir. Elaine, thou liest. Lie, sir. Splud, you're but a man, sir. Rogan thief, restore him. Take heed, Sir Pertharwell, of what you do. He'll bear no coals, so I can bear you in my word. I can tell you my word. This is rare. It's moral he stabs you not. By this life he hath stabbed forty for forty times less matter. I can tell you my knowledge. I will make thee stoop, thou abject. Make him stoop, sir. <laughs> Gentlemen, pass by more he'll be killed. Is he so tall a man? Tall man, if you love his life, stand betwixt them. Make him stoop. My dog, villain, or I will hang thee. Thou hast confessed robberies and other felonious acts to this gentleman, thy countenance. I'll bear, I'll bear no witness. 
And without my dog, I will hang thee for them. Shift kneels. What kneel to thine enemies? Pardon me, good sir. God is my witness. I never did robbery in all my life. Re-enter Fungoso. Oh, sir, Pontevalo, your dog lies giving up the ghost in the woodyard. What? Is he not dead yet? A dog born to disastrous fortune. Pray you conduct me, sir. Exit Pontevalo with uh, Fungoso. Oh, did you never do any robbery in your life? Oh, this is good. So he swore, sir. I, I heard him, and did you swear true, sir? I, as I hope to be forgiven, sir, I ne'er robbed any man. I never stood by the highway side, sir, but only said so because I would get myself a name and be counted a tall man. Now, out, base Philaco, now my resolution, I thy countenance, by this light, gentlemen, he hath confessed to me the most inexorable company of robberies and damned himself that he did them. Never heard the like. Out, scoundrel! Out! Follow me no more, I command thee. Out of my sight. Go hence, speak not. I will not hear thee. Away, Camuccio. And exit shift. Oh, how I do feed upon this now and fat myself. Here were a couple expectedly dishumoured. Well, by this time I hope Sir Pantavalo and his dog are both out of humour to travel. Nay, gentlemen, why do you not seek out the knight and comfort him? Our supper at the Mitra must of necessity hold tonight, if you love your reputations. Oh, God, I'm so melancholy for his dog's disaster. But I'll go. Faith, and I may go too, but I know I shall be so melancholy. Tush, melancholy. You must forget that now. And remember, you like the mercy of the fury. Carlo will, rans- will rack your sinews asunder and tell you to dust if you come not. And they exit, leaving us with a chorus. Oh, then, their fear of Carlo, belike, makes them hold their meeting. Aye, here he comes. Conceive him but to be entered the mitre, and tis enough. And Act 5, Scene 4, enter Carlo. Hola, where be these shot sharks? Enter the drawer. Boy and boy, you're welcome, good master Buffone. Where's George? Call me George hither, quickly. What wine please you have, sir? I'll, I'll draw you that sneak, master Buffone. Away, neophyte, do as I bid thee. Bring my dear George to me. Enter George. Uh, Mass, here he comes. Welcome, Master Carlo. What, is supper ready, George? Aye, sir, almost. We have a cloth laid, Master Carlo. What else? Are none of the gallants come yet? Not yet, sir. Stay, take me with you, George. Let me have a good fat loin of pork laid to the fire presently. (laughs) It shall, sir. And with all hear you, draw me the biggest shaft you have out of of the butt you wot of. Away. You know my meaning, George. Quick. Done, sir. Exit George. I never hungered so much for anything in my life as I do for our gallant success at court. Now is that lean, bald rib Matilente, that salt villain, plotting some mischievous device and lies us soaking in their frothy humors like a dry crust till he has drunk them all up. Hmm. Could the pumice but hold up his eyes at other men's happiness in a reasonable proportion, slid the slave or to be loved next heaven. Uh, just uh, pausing there for Carlo. Um... Could the pumice, the pumice, but hold of his eyes to other men's happiness in any reasonable proportion, slid the slave were to be loved next heaven above honor, wealth, rich fare, apparel, wenches, all the delights, the belly and the groin, whatever. And re-enter George with two jugs of a wine. These are, uh, yes, uh, the, the, the props are going to be quite important coming up. Yeah. Master Carlo. 
Is it right, boy? Aye, sir, I assure you, tis right. Well said, my dear George. Depart. And exit George. Come, my small gimblet. You are the false scabbard. Away, so. And puts forth the drawer and shuts the door. Now to you, Sir Burgomaster, let's taste your bounty. And we go back briefly to the chorus. What? Will he deal upon such quantities of wine alone? You will perceive that, sir. Back to the scene. Hi, Mary, sir. Here's purity. Oh, George, I could bite off his nose for this now, sweet rogue. He has drawn nectar, the very soul of the grape. I'll wash my temples with some on it presently and drink some half score draughts. Twill heat the brain, kindle my imagination. I shall talk nothing but crackers and fireworks tonight. So, sir, please you to be here, sir, and I here, so. And sets the two cups asunder, drinks uh, with one and pledges with the other, speaking for each of the cups and drinking alternately. This is worth the observation, Signor. Now, sir, here's to you. I present you with so much of my love. I take it kindly from you, sir. And will return you the like proportion. But with all, sir, remembering the merry night we had at the Countess's, you know where, sir. By heaven, you put me in mind now of a of a very necessary office, which I will propose in your pledge, sir, the health of that honorable countess and the sweet lady that sat by here, sir. I do veil it to the reverence. Now, senor, with these ladies, I'll, do, I'll be bold to mix the health of your divine mistress. Do you know her, sir? Oh, Lord, sir, in the respectful memory and mention of her, I could wish this wine were the most precious drug in the world. Good faith, sir, you do honor me exceedingly. Whom should he personate in this, senor? Faith, I know not, sir. Observe, observe him. If it were the basest filth or mud that runs in the channel, I am bound to pledge it respectively, sir. And now, sir, here is a replenished bowl, which I will reciprocally turn upon you to health, to the health of the Count Frugale. The Count Frugale's health, sir, I'll pledge it on my knees by this light. And Carlo now kneels. Continuing cup business, one cup after another. <laughs> hey, do me right, sir. So I do in faith, good sir. Good faith you do not. Mine was fuller. Why, believe me, it was not. Believe me, it was. And you do lie. Lie, sir. I, sir. Swoons, you rascal. Oh, come stab if you have a mind to it. Stab? Dost thou think I dare not? Nay, I beseech you, gentlemen, what means this? Nay, look, for shame, your reputations. And overturns wine pots, cups, and all. Act 5, scene 5. Enter Massalente. Why, how now, Carlo? What humour's this? <laughs> oh, my good mischief, art thou come? Where are the rest? Where are the rest? Faith, three of our ordnance are burst. First, how comes that? Faith, overcharged, overcharged. But did not the train hold? Oh, yes, and the poor lady is irrecoverably blown up. <laughs> Why, but which of the uh, munitions is miscarried, huh? Imprimis, sir, Pontavolo, next the countenance and resolution. How, how, for the love of wit. Troth, the resolution is proved recreant, the countenance hath changed his copy, and the passionate knight is shedding funeral tears over his departed dog. What? Is the dog dead? Poisoned, tis thought. Marry, how or by whom? That's left for some cunning woman here on the bank side to resolve. 
For my part, I know nothing more than we are like to have an exceedingly melancholy supper of it. No, it's like, I had purpose to be extraordinarily merry. I had drunk off a good preparative of old sack here. But will they come? Will they come? They will assuredly come. Marry, Carlo. As thou lovest me, run over a more freely tonight, and especially the night. Spare no sulphurous jest that may come out of the sweaty forge of thine, but ply them with all manner of shot, minion, saker, culverin, or anything, what thou wilt. <laughs> I warrant thee, my dear case of Petrionels, so I stand not in dread of thee, but that thou wilt second me? Why, my good German tapster, I will. What, George? Lom Lomtero? Lomtero. And sings and dances and enter George. Did you call, Master Carlo? More nectar, George. Lomtero. Your meat's ready, sir, and your company will come. Is the loin pork enough? <laughs> Aye, sir, it is enough. And ex George. Pork, heart, what dost thou with such a greasy dish? I think thou dost varnish thy face with the fat on it. Looks so like a glue pot. True, my raw boned rogue. And if thou wouldst farce thy lean ribs with it too, they would not, like ragged lass, rub out so many doublets as they do. But thou knowest not a good dish, thou. Oh, it's the only nourishing meat in the world. No marvel, though, that saucy, stubborn generation, the Jews, were forbidden it. For what would they have done well pampered with fat pork that durst murmur at their maker out of garlic and onions. It's like, fed with it, the horse on strummel patch, goggle-eyed, grumble dories would have gigantomachized. Re-enter George with wine. Oh, well said, my sweet George. Phil, Phil. Briefly popping to the chorus. Savors too much of profanation. Oh, oh. servitor ad uh, imum. They're, they're still chorus. Still servitor. Chorus. I'm a liar, sorry. Ad imum. Qualis ab incoepto processerit et sibi constet. The necessity of his vein compels a toleration for. Bar this and dash him out of humor before his time. Tis an axiom in natural philosophy, what comes nearest the nature that it feeds, converts quicker to nourishment, and doth sooner essentiate. Not, now nothing in flesh and entrails assimilates or resembles man more than a hog or swine. And drinks. True. And he, to requite their courtesy, oftentimes doffeth his own nature and puts on theirs, as when he becomes as churlish as a hog or as drunk as a sow. But to your conclusion. Drinks. Mary, I say nothing resembling man more than swine. It follows nothing can be more nourishing. For indeed, but that it abhors from our nice nature. If we feed upon one another, we should shoot up a great deal faster and thrive much better. I refer me to your usurious cannibals or such like, but since it is so contrary, pork. Pork is your only feed. I take it. <clears throat> your devil be of the same diet. He would never have desired to have been incorporated into swine else. Oh, here comes the melancholy mess upon him. Carlo, charge, charge. Act five, scene six. Enter the rest of the party. Enter Ponta, Verlo, Fastidious, Bricks, uh, Brisk, Sogliado, and Fungoso. For God, Sir Puntaravolo, I am sorry for your heaviness. Body o' me, a shrewd mischance. Why had you no unicorn's horn nor bezoar's stone about you, huh? Sir, I would request you be silent. Nay, to him again. Take comfort, good knight. If your cat have recovered her catar, fear nothing. Your dog's mischance may be holpen. Say how, sweet Carlo, the god mend me. The poor knight's moans draw me into fellowship of his misfortunes. But be not discouraged, good Sir Pontevalo. 
I'm content your adventure shall be performed upon your cat. I believe you, must God. I believe you, for rather than thou wouldst make present repayment, thou wouldst take it upon his own bare return from Calais. Nay, Slipe, he'll be content, so he were well rid of his company to pay him five for one at his next meeting at him and Paul's. Uh, but for your dog, Sir Pontevolo, if he be not outright dead, there's a friend of mine, a quack solver, shall put life in him again, that's certain. Oh no, that comes too late. Brushes, night, will you suffer this? Drawer, get me a candle and hard wax presently. Exit George. Aye, and bring up supper for I'm so melancholy. Oh, senor, where's your resolution? Resolution? Hang him, rascal. Oh, Carlo, if you love me, do not mention him. Why? How so? Oh, the arrantist crocodile that ever Christian was acquainted with. By my gentry, I shall think the worst of tobacco while I live for his sake. I did think him to be as tall a man. Nay, before nay. The knight, the knight. Slud. He looks like an image carved out of a box full of knots. His face is, for all the world, like a Dutch purse with the mouth downward. His beard, the tassels, and he walks, uh, let me see, as melancholy as one of the masters side in the counter. Uh, do you hear, Sir Pantarvolo? Sir, I do entreat you no more, but enjoin you to silence as you affect your peace. Nay, but dear knight, understand here are none but friends, and such as wish you well. I would have you know, do this now. Flay me your dog presently, but in any case keep the head, and stuff his skin well with straw, as you see these dead monsters at Bartholomew Fair. I shall be sudden, I tell you. Oh, if you like not that, sir, tell me somewhat of a less dog and clap into his skin here's a slave about the town here a, a jew one johan or a fellow that makes perukes with glue on it artificially it shall be discerned besides it will be so much the warmer for the hound to travel it you know so pontavolo death can you be so patient or thus you may have as you come through germany a familiar for little or nothing, shall turn itself into the shape of your dog, or anything, what you will, for certain hours. Pontarello hits me. That's my life, knight. What do you mean? You offer no violence, will you? Hold, hold. Uh, yes, having been hit, re-enter George with wax and a lighted candle. Death, you slave, you ban dog, you. As you love wit. Stay the enraged knight, gentlemen. By my knighthood, he that stirs in his rescue dies. Drawer, be gone. Exit George. Murder! 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 Aye! Are you howling, you wolf? Gentlemen, as you tender your lives, suffer no man to fill my... Su suffer no man to enter till my revenge be perfect. Sirrah, Bafone, lie down. Make no exclamations, but down. Down, you cur, or I will make thy blood flow on my rapier hilts. Sweet knight, hold in thy fury, and for heaven I'll honor thee more than the Turk does Mohammed. Down, I say. Carlo lies down. Who's there? There's knocking within. Here's the constable, open the doors. Good Marcellante, open no door. If the Adelanta, if the ad, if the Adelantado of Spain were here, he should not enter. One help me with the light, gentlemen. You knock in vain, sir officer. A too brute. Sirrah, close your lips, or I will drop it in thine eyes by heaven. Oh, oh! Open the door, or I will break it open. Nay, good constable, have patience a little. You shall come in presently. We have almost done. Montavolo <clears throat> seals up Carlo's lips. So, now, 
Are you out of your humour, sir? Shift, gentlemen. They all draw and run out, except Fungoso, who conceals himself behind the table. Act 5, Scene 7, enter Constable and Officers, and seize Fastidious as he is rushing by. Lay hold upon this gallant and pursue the rest. Lay hold on me, sir? For what? Marry for your right ear, sir, with the rest of your companions. My right? Master, Constable, take heed what you do. Carlo, did I offer any violence? Oh, sir, you see he is not in case to answer you, and that makes you so peremptory. Re-enter George and Drawer. Peremptory? Slight like appeal to the drawers. I did him any hard measure. They're all gone. There's none of them that will be laid any hold on. Well, sir, you are like to answer till uh, the rest can be found out. Slid I appeal to George here. Oh, t- George was not here. Away with him to the counter, sirs. Come, sir, you will best get yourself dressed somewhere. Exuant constable and officers with Fastidious and Carlo. Good Lord, that Master Carlo could not take heed, and knowing what a gentleman the knight is if he be angry. Pox on them, they, they've left all the meat on our hands. Would they were choked with it for me? Re enter Massalente. What? Are they gone, sirs? Oh, <laughs> here's Mr. Massalente. Sirrah, George, do you see that concealment there? That napkin under the table? Odd, so, Senior Fungoso. He's good pawn for the reckoning. Be sure you keep him here, and let him not go away till I come again. Though he offered to discharge all, I'll return presently. Cyril, we have a pawn for the reckoning. What, of Massalente? No. Look under the table. I hope I'll be quiet now. If I can get but forth of the street, I care not, masters. I pray you tell me. Is the constable gone? What? Master Fungoso. Was it not a good device, the same of me, sirs? Yes, Faith. Have you been here all this while? Oh, Lord, I, good sir, look on the coast, be clear. I'd fain be going. (laughs) All's clear, sir, but the reckoning, and that you must clear and pay before you go, I assure you. I lost my spot, I'm so sorry. I pay. Yes, I pay slight. So, all's clear, sir, but the reckoning. That's my line. And then your I pay slight, I eat not a bit. I've completely lost it. The the spot. I pay slight. Sorry, I got it now. I pay slight. I eat not a bit since I came into the house yet. Why, well, you may when you please. It's already below that was bespoken. Be spoken? Not by me, I hope. By you, sir. I know not that, but was for you and your company, I am sure. My company. Slid, I was an invited guest, so I was. Faith, we have nothing to do with that, sir. We, they're all gone but you, and we must be answered. That's the short and long of it. Nay, if you will grow to extremities, my masters, then with this pot, cup, and all were in my belly, if I have a cross about me. What? And have such apparel? Do not say so, senor. That mightily discredits your clothes. As I am an honest man, my tailor had all my money this morning, and yet I must be fain to alter my suit too. Good sirs, let me go. Tis Friday night, and in good truth, I have no stomach in the world to eat anything. That's no matter, so you pay, sir. Slight, with what conscience can you ask me to pay that I never drank for? Yes, sir, I did see you drink once. By this cup, which is silver, but you did not. You you do me infinite wrong. I looked in the pot once, indeed, but I did not drink. Well, sir, if you can satisfy our master, it shall be all one to us. George! Bye and bye. And they exit, leaving us briefly with the chorus. Lose not yourself now, senor. Act 5, scene 8, enter Massalente and Delero. Tut, sir, you did bear too hard a conceit of me in that. 
but I will not make my love to you most transparent, in spite of any dust of suspicion that may be raised to cloud it. And henceforth, since I see it is so against your humour, I will never labour to persuade you. Why, thank you, Signor. But what is that you tell me which may concern my peace so much? Faith, sir, tis thus. Your wife's brother, Signor Fungoso, being at supper tonight at a tavern with a sort of gallants, there happened some division amongst them, and he is left in pawn for the reckoning. Now, if ever you look that time shall present you with a happy occasion to do your wife some gracious and acceptable service, take hold of this opportunity and presently go and redeem him. For being her brother and his credit so amply engaged as now it is, when she shall hear, as he cannot himself, but he must out of extremity report it, that you came and offered yourself so kindly and with that respect of his reputation, why, the benefit cannot but make her dote and grow mad of your affections. Now, oh, by heaven, Macalenti, I acknowledge myself exceedingly indebted to you by this kind tender of your love. And I'm sorry to remember that I was ever so rude to neglect a friend of your importance. Bring me shoes and a cloak here. I was going to bed if you had not come. What tavern is it? The meter, sir. Why, Fido, my shoes. Good faith, it cannot but please her exceedingly. Enter for lace. Come, I marvel what piece of night work you have in hand now, that you call for a cloak and your shoes. What, is this your candor? Oh, sweet wife, speak lower. I would not he should hear thee for a world. Hang him, rascal. I cannot abide him for his treachery with his wi wild, quick-set beard there. Whether go you now with him? No, with, with him, dear wife. I go alone to a place from whence I will return instantly. Good Macalenti, acquaint not her with it by any means. May come so much more accepted. Frame some other answer. I'll come back immediately. Exit Delirio. Nay, and I be not worth to know whether you go. Stay till I take knowledge of your coming back. Hear you, Mistress Deliro. So, sir, and what say you? Faith, lady, my intents will not deserve this slight respect when you shall know. Your intents? Why, what may your intents be, for God's sake? Troth, the time allows no circumstance, lady. Therefore know this was but a device to remove your husband hence and bestow him securely whilst with more conveniency I might report to you a misfortune that hath happened to Monsieur Brisk. Nay, comfort, sweet lady, this night, being at supper, a sort of young gallant committed a riot, for the which he, is only, he, he only is apprehended and carried to the counter, where, if your husband and other creditors should but have knowledge of him, the poor gentleman were undone for ever. Ah, me, that he were here. Now, therefore, if you can think upon any present means for his delivery, do not forslow it. A bribe to the officer that committed him will do it. Oh, Lord, sir, he shall not want for a bribe. Pray you, will you commend me to him and say I'll visit him presently? No, lady, I shall do you better service in protracting your husband's return that you may go with more safety. Good truth, so you may. Farewell, good sir. And exit Massalente. Lord, how a woman may be mistaken in a man. I would have sworn upon all the testaments in the world he had not loved, Master Brisk. Bring me keys there, maid. Alas, good gentleman, if all I have in this earthly world will pleasure him, it shall be at his service. And exit for lace, leaving us with the chorus. Massalente sweats in this business, if you mark him. I, you shall see the true picture of spite anon. Here comes the pawn and his redeemer. Act 5, scene 9, enter Deliro, Fungoso and George. Come, brother, be not discouraged for this. And what? No, truly, I am not discouraged, but I protest to you, brother. I have done imitating any more gall gallants, either in purse or apparel. 
but as shall become a gentleman, for good carriage or so. You say well. This is all in the bill here, is it not? Aye, sir. There's your money, tell it. And brother, I'm glad I met with so good an occasion to show my love with to you. I will study to deserve it in good truth, and I live. What? It's right? Aye, sir. And I thank you. Let me have a cap capon's leg saved. Now the reckoning is paid. You shall, sir. Exit George. Enter Macalente. Where's Signor De Liro? Here, Macalente. Hark you, sir. Have you dispatched this same? Aye, Mary, I ha have I. Well, then I can tell you news. Brisk is in the counter. In the counter? Tis true, sir. Committed for the stir here tonight. Now would I have you send your brother home before him? with the report of this your kindness done him to his sister, which will so pleasingly possess her, and out of his mouth too, that in the meantime you may clap your action on brisk, and your wife, being in so happy a mood, cannot entertain it ill by any means. She is very true. She cannot indeed, I think. Think? Why, tis past thought. You shall never meet the like opportunity, I assure you. I will do it. Brother... Pray you go home before this gentleman, and I pray you go home before this gentleman and I have some private business, and tell my sweet wife I'll come presently. I will, brother. And, Signor, acquaint your sister how liberally and out of his bounty your brother has used you, do you see? Made you a man of good reckoning, redeemed that you never were possessed of credit, gave you as gentlemanlike terms as might be, found no fault with your coming behind the fashion, nor nothing. Nay, I'm out of those humours now. Well, if you be out, keep your distance, and be not made a shot clog any more. Come, Signor, let's make haste. And they exit. Act 5, Scene 10. Enter Felice and Fastidious Brisk. Oh, Master Fastidious, what... Pity it is to see so sweet a man as you are in so sour a place. And she kisses Fastidious, passing us to the chorus. As upon her lips, does she mean? Hmm. This is to be imagined the Count would be like. Troth, fair lady, tis first the pleasure of the fates, next of the constable to have it so. But I am patient, and indeed in comforted the more in your kind visit. Nay, you shall be comforted in me more than this, if you please, sir. I sent you word by my brother, sir, that my husband laid to rest you this morning. I, I, now, I know now whether you received it or no. No, believe it, sweet creature. Your brother gave me no such intelligence. Oh, the Lord. But has your husband any such purpose? Oh, sweet master Brisk, yes, and therefore... He present he presently discharged, for if he come with his actions upon you, Lord deliver you. You are in for one half a score a year. He kept a poor man in Ludgate Ludgate once twelve years for sixteen shillings. Where is your keeper? For love's sake, call him. Let him take a bribe to dispatch you. Lord, how my heart trembles. Here are no spies, are there? No, sweet mistress. Why are you into this passion? O oh Lord, Master Fastidious, if you knew how I took up my husband today when he said you would, he would arrest you, and how I railed at him that persuaded him to it, the scholar there, who on my conscience loves you now, and what care I took to send you intelligence by my brother, and how I gave him four sovereigns for his pains, and now how I came running out hither without man or boy with me, so soon as I heard on it, and you'd say I were in a passion indeed. Your keeper, for God's sake, O oh Master Brisk, as tis in Euphius, hard is the choice when one is compelled either by silence to die with grief or by speaking to live with shame. Fair lady, I conceive you not, and this may this kiss assure you that where adversity hath, it were, as it were, contracted, prosperity shall not that's me, your husband! Indeed, enter Deliro and Massalente. Oh, me. Aye, is it thus? 
Why, how now, Signor De Niro? Has the wolf seen you, huh? Has Gorgon's head made marble of you? Some planet strike me dead. Why, look you, sir, I told you, you might have suspected this long afore, had you pleased and have staged, saved this labour of admiration now, and passion, and such extremities as this frail lump of flesh is subject unto. Nay, why do you not dote, sin now, signor? Methinks you should say it were some enchantment, deceptio visus, or so, ha! If you could persuade yourself it were a dream now, to were excellent. Faith, try what you can do, signor. It may be your imagination will be brought to it in time. There's nothing impossible. Sweet husband. Out, lascivious strumpet. And with that out, exit Deliro. What? Did you see how ill that stale vein became him? a four of sweet wife and dear heart, and are you fallen just into the same now with sweet husband? Away, follow him, go, keep state. What? Remember you are a woman, turn impudent, give him not the head, though you give him the horns. Away, and yet methinks you should take your leave of enfant perdu here, your forlorn hope. Exit Felice. How now, Monsieur Brisk? What, Friday night and in affliction too? And yet your poor pimenta, your delicate morsels, I perceive the affection of ladies and gentlewomen pursues you wheresoever you go, monsieur. Now, in good faith, and as I am gentle, there could not have come a thing in this world to have distracted me more than the wrinkled fortunes of this poor dame. Oh, yes, sir. I can tell you a thing will distract you much better, believe it. Signor De Lero has entered three actions against you. Three actions, Monsieur. Marry, one of them, I'll put you in comfort, is but 3,000, and the other two, some 5,000 pound together. Trifles, trifles. Oh, I'm undone. Nay, not altogether so, sir. The knight must have his 100 pound repaid. That will help too. And then six score pounds for a diamond, you know where. These be things will weigh, monsieur. They will weigh. Oh, heaven. What? Do you sigh? This is to kiss the hand of a countess, to have her coach sent for you, to hang poignards in ladies' garters, to wear bracelets of their hair. And for every one of these great favours, to give some slight jewel of five hundred crowns or so. Why, tis nothing. Now, monsieur, you see the plague that treads on the heels of your foppery? Well, go your ways. In. Remove yourself to the two-penny ward quickly, to save charges, and there set up your rest to spend, sir, Sir Pontevalo's hundred pound for him. Away, good commander, go. And exit fastidious. And here, just a note for anyone following along at home, there are variations in the text from this point. We're going to do one variation on the text. Um, we were planning on actually doing all the variations, there, uh, but uh, sadly we don't have time. So uh, this particular iteration, uh, 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 we continue with the exit of fastidious and Massalente continues talking. The chorus will join in in a moment, because of course Massalente uh, is also being played by the same actor as someone uh, uh, as Asper from the beginning of the play for those who remember that far back <laughs> why here's a change now is my soul at peace i am as empty of all envy now as they of merit to be envied at my humor like a flame no longer lasts that it hath stuff to feed it and their folly being now raked up in their repentant ashes affords no ampler subject to my spleen I am so far from malicing their states that I begin to pity them. It grieves me to think they have a being. I could wish they might turn wise upon it and be saved now, so heaven were pleased, but let them vanish vapours. Gentlemen, how like you it? Has it not been tedious? Nay, we have done censuring now. Yes, faith. How so? Mary, because we'll imitate your actors and be out of our humours. Besides, 
here are those round about you of more ability in censure than we, whose judgments can give it a more satisfying allowance. We'll refer you to them. And exuant cordatus and amitus, and Massalenti is left with the the audience. Aye, is it even so? Well, gentlemen, I should have gone in and returned to you as I was asper at the first, but by reason the shift would have been somewhat long, and we are loth to draw your patience farther. We'll entreat you to imagine it, and now that you may see I will be out of humour for company, I stand wholly to your kind approbation, and indeed am nothing so peremptory as I was in the beginning. Marry, I will not do as Plautus in his Amphitrio, for all this sumni jovis causa plaudite, beg a plaudite for God's sake, beg a plaudite for God's sake, but if you, out of the bounty of your good liking, will bestow it, why? You may in time make lean Massalente as fat as Sir John Forster. And exit Massalente. There is some additional material um, uh, the, the, for the presentation before the uh, the Queen at Court, um, and there is uh, uh, some alternative uh, variations on uh, on the very closing of the text. But I say we we don't have time to look at that now, um, and <laughs> so we're just going to sort of rattle straight into. Um, all the stuff to talk about, all the stuff that we've crammed in too much. I mean, it's interesting, this week we started by doing too much stopping and starting and then we sort of found a happy medium and now we've done too much in one go and there's too much to take in. Um, uh, I, I've definitely now got a sense of the play and what to do with the play. There are lots of really nice options actually here to to hack it down to a performable text. Um, uh, it, it It's very doable, actually, with one or two quite big changes um uh one of which is the obvious elephant in the room which is they killed the fucking dog they poisoned the poor thing yeah so i'm i i think during somewhere during that 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 climactic pub fight um the dog needs to be resurrected i, I i'm sorry i'm not having the dog dog uh, that's 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 a no that's a no i mean i i know this is satire and satire can go quite dark but I'm I'm not in the mood for killing the dog. I'm I'm not going there. Um, yeah, lots of thoughts that we could have. Uh, Bryony, um, I'll go to you. But more, even more than killing the dog, which was a bad thing to do. <laughs> then we have this whole conversation about dressing another dog up in the skin of the dead dog, because killing the dog wasn't bad enough. What? I I, I actually liked that. Not because I like it as a concept, um, but because, I mean, Carlo by that point is so absolutely off his face. He's just saying all the terrible thoughts are pouring out of him. And it's, he thinks that's the best idea ever. And he's, you know, everybody in the room is just going, no, read the room, mate, read the room. Uh, which, because it leads to the fight. I mean, Pontarvolo goes for him for very good cause. Wow. So it's, it's I, I actually really love that um, because, as I say, Carlo has this extended drinking scene and he drinks more and more and it's this really interesting set piece. I think that's that's really nicely put together. And it's it's one of those bits where you're going, you know this is designed for an actor to then push over all his props and get a round of applause from the audience. It, it's designed for that. And that's why I'm sort of thinking so much of this is built around set pieces for specific actors to do their turn. Um, that That's... That's what I'm, I'm. I'm feeling that there's a lot of that in this text. Um, it's very actor-led. It's not really interested in plot because of that. Because it's mu it's much more interesting in giving actors things. Um, that's my feeling, anyway. Um, uh, Elizabeth, uh, who's come in on the final day and probably has <laughs> totally lost. <laughs> For someone who is so unlikable, Masalente had a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. Masalente is the big, big gaping hole in the centre of this. <laughs> and it's just like, as horrible as he is, and as awful the things he does is, he doesn't even explain why he poisons the dog. He just does it. Um, he is the kind of the person we're left with at the end. Yeah, I also want him to get a comeuppance. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, that needs to be manufactured. Um, you know, when the dog is saved, um, the dog points a, 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 a finger. <laughs> at the, it was him. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how far to take that. But um, uh, but yeah, it, basically, if we're looking for a play, 
it's the last two acts, pretty much, with some material from the first three. Um, the actual, you know, stuff happening part of the play is actually what we did today. We've sort of crammed the play into today. Um, and even then, it still had an awful lot of set pieces and stopping and starting. So I've got the stop the, Save the Dog play um, with the subplot of Fungoso and Fastidious Brisk and their clothing um, death match, which I really love as a little mini subplot. Um, but I really, really, uh, and we've got a very small, short morality play about Sordido from uh, from earlier in the week, which is a nice, detachable, entirely separate play. I quite like mm -hmm. that. It has, I don't know what it's hit doing here. It adds nothing um, apart from it's interesting. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I, I'm really not interested in the the family dynamic actually of Felice, uh, her husband, and um, and fastidious in that relationship it doesn't interest me um because it's all centering on malicente um, uh, masilente being an ass continually mm. i've been talking a lot because uh, i've had lots of thoughts uh, other thoughts about you know, we got all this material what do you uh, what what combinations do you want to go for i'm going for a positive take here just just saying it's too long is not an answer uh, eric well, I've only been here for the last day, so I can't really speak to the rest of the stuff. But um, Maslente seems a bit like uh, like the malevolent from the Marston play, just like ten times worse. Mm. Like doing stuff because uh, it's fun to make people suffer, kind of thing. Um, because you know sometimes it is, but it depends on the person, I guess. Um, just killing someone's dog seems one tad too far. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm sort of intrigued by the whole dog shenanigans and like the whole. I bet I can go abroad with my dog and my cat and everything will be fine. And um, yeah, I don't know how you would get pet passports for that one. Yeah, I mean it's 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 such a ridiculously stupid plan. Pontovalo Pot has that. I mean it, it's it's pointed out in advance that it's a really terrible plan, and he still goes for it. Um, but. Yeah, um, yeah. Considering Masalente is sort of the, the the personification of the playwright, I mean, is this a comment on you know all playwrights are fundamentally sociopathic murderers? Um, I mean, that's basically <laughs> what what playwrights are like. You know, we create all these lovely characters and then we do horrible things to them. It's so much fun. Um, <laughs> that is that is all history. That is all drama and comedy and reduced down to its its most cynical uh, viewpoint. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, that mm, Montalente. Yeah, I, 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 I do think there's sort of a there's a a word in linguistics for when you switch sounds around. That his name is even supposed to be. It's hard not to say malicente. You know, it's mm. hard not to turn it into malicious um, by just in, you know switching a couple of consonants. So, yeah, some playwrights like to create a world where we imagine unlikely but attractive solutions to impossible to intractable problems it turns out that the um that the poor but good-hearted boyfriend is actually the son he's actually the heir to a fortune and so the the rich girl can marry him after all you know the gilbert and sullivan effect um and and if malicente or Mal malicente is a figure for Johnson and in the end he says, well, now everyone's been punished to my satisfaction. I'm going to stop being such an asshole. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. especially as they, they punish Ponto, uh, Ponto uh who who oh. is lovely. I mean, I, I mean, he's not actually the most extreme humorous character on stage. It's um, it, it, it's sort of, why do they do that to him? Yeah, I mean, he's, maybe he's not very bright, but he's he's lovely. But, but he's not a bad person but i guess in you know in in johnson's world in his in his worldview um it's better to be smart and kind of amoral you're a more worthy person if you're clever and have no basically sort of moral core than it is to be kind of decent but stupid that's that's what he likes better i guess i don't know maybe we should frame it as a tragedy the tragedy of ponta pontavaro uh, volo um, you know, and, and it ends with him, you know, beating 
beating uh, uh, Carlo to death and on, on on a pub table, and they all get arrested and dragged away, and 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 that's that's that we're left with this really bleak, bleak picture of 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 of, of early modern life. Um, actually, I quite like that. Uh, anyway, sorry, Eric. <laughs> I, I do like the the thing of you know sort of uh, the naivete of you know like comic characters or like thinking everything is perfectly fine. Oh yes, I'll leave my dog with a stranger. No, nothing can possibly go wrong. Even though this dog is a thoroughbred of utmost value, and I will lose a bet that will be yeah. It feels very sort of um, you know ca- cartoonish. It's like nothing, nothing can possibly go wrong. Mm. Yeah. Um... So yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm seeing lots of shorts coming out of this, I, I, and I see several different cuts as to what this play could be. Um, I'm, I'm really curious to think what the original production cut might have been like. I mean, you know, what bits would they have focused in on? Is it more focusing on the plot at the end, um, or, or was it much more sort of uh, just just a series of of sequences? Uh, any uh, final thought? I'm not going to go around the room for final thoughts because we're we're already uh, uh, in extra time. Uh, anyone uh, want to throw in a final, final cut or a final uh, option? Uh, what what you might do with this, um, Alan? Yeah, I mean, I I thought almost from the off that this is a sketch show mm. that just happens to lack any real continuity material, <laughs> and I think. I know you've asserted that it needs to be cut by half to bring it to a performable stage. I think you may be modest in your expectations there. No, no, I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't think that. Um, I mean, it depends on your definition of how long a comedy should be. If we're going for comedy, um, it, it would have to be more than half if if we're going for a more light comedy uh, mo- mode. Because uh, you know, once you hit two hours, you stop hitting the definition of is it really a comedy anymore I, I, I think you've got several sequences in there which are probably 10 minute sketches which work quite nicely on their own but mm. the continuity just doesn't seem to be there for me and yeah. I've been here right the way through it yeah mm. I, I mean I'm definitely seeing that this is this is material for a live show so if we're doing a live show with bits of Johnson um, you know there's mm. there's so many good bits in this that could be um, you know sharpened up uh, isolated and said, "Bam! Here's 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 a yeah. fifteen I mean, cut- minute, here's a twenty minute, here's a tenner, um, and, and that would make a good, you know, forty five minute hour long show." Um, yeah, I mean, Car- Carlo's one man show, one man yes. drinking scene. Mm. I I could see someone carrying that off very nicely and getting a bloody good round of applause for it. Mm. There's always a little danger when you isolate scenes or sequences that outside of the context of knowing the character and where they're coming from, that the scene doesn't quite land in isolation. Um, that's my slight worry about, because that Carlo sequence is actually, it is actually plot important, because, of course, it, his increasing drunkenness and his increasing foulness and, you know, the anti-Semitism and the other stuff that creeps in, um, and it throws in some Islamophobia. He really, really does do, do, do the trifecta, actually, at one point. Um, mm. And uh, is, is actually dramatically important as well. So um, there, there is a bit... I'm a little worried about that, that particular thing because I think in context it would work. I'm not wholly certain in, certain in isolation. Uh, it actually quite lands. I think you'd need different dialogue. The same setup, but different dialogue. I could be wrong. Uh, Dan, this is all definitely not going to be about whether how it, how it should be staged. Although I do think, just as a as a piece of study, it's a very interesting play, because for for other reasons, because of the fact that Johnson's fingerprints are literally all over this play, in in terms of not only his characterization of I mean the personification of himself there, but how much he really tries to control every single aspect of this play um, down to um, how the characters should be acting to every single type of stage direction imaginable to the fact it was printed three times in the same year. Um, Mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, the positive side of that is maybe because it was super popular and he wanted to have this longer version out there that people didn't get a chance to see because there was such demand for this kind of play. 
Um, the other one idea would be, of course, because he wasn't happy with each printing it, or he just wanted to have it so much out there to try to flood the market with, hey, you know, go 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 look at my work out there. It's it's fantastic. Um, I do say so myself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm very interested in how this reads with his other works from that time period, as well as the other satires of that period, because I, I'd like to see if this is really a super popular play or not. It is really unusual to see it printed by three different printers in the same year, I would say. And then, of course, it was, you know, the works, his own baby in 1616. And he further tinkers with it. And so many of the uh, items in it are definitely set in such a way, such as shared lines abound, which are not in any of the first three printings. Um, different types of fonts to indicate in italics versus small caps, things like that. And it's really, really particular. Share um, stage directions that tell you just things that you wouldn't see by other playwrights. Um, that type of controls why I want to see this play staged. Because I, and I'd like to see it staged in the way that he sort of conceived it, because I feel like more than any other playwright out there, you almost can't not get who he, what he was trying to do because mm -hmm. he's so descriptive in what he does. Whereas with every other playwright out there, I feel like you have much more room to interpret it your way. Mm -hmm. Johnson definitely has his way. <laughs> and so I'd want to see that version. So then I have a real picture of what Johnson wants to get across and not just well, what this director wants to yeah, do but, with it. But, I mean, the problem with trying to recreate what, what Johnson wants is, of course, you then have to interface it with a reality of, you know, of, of trying to stage a show that is this long and actually have an audience to watch it. Well, and absolutely. Is, it, it, yeah. it's, it's almost a, you know, it's a lovely hypothetical, but it's basically um, impossible. Uh, no, it is impossible. Yeah, but which, which more than strange. anything, yeah. I mean, the just... other question is: is 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 Massalente uh, Johnson, or is it a, a satire of another playwright? Um, you know, uh, you know, or a little mix of it. This is always the problem with um, any, right. anything satirical or, or things like that. You know, is is that what he's actually doing, or is he doing something something very different? You know, I always caution against that. I mean, I, I actually really push against any type of argument. Well, this is the playwright's intention here and there. Mm. This is like the one exception of it all, <laughs> where Johnson really seems to be inserting himself. It's not the first time he's inserted himself in place. Or but he's inserting critiques. himself in three yeah. characters simultaneously. It's not right. So it's it's he's, yeah. he's muddying the waters there. Which you know, will the real Ben Johnson yeah. please stand up? Right. <laughs> to talk to quote Eminem again there. Mm. Yeah. We're doing well. Please stand down. Is what <laughs> yeah. Sit down, Ben. Uh, Eric. I just wanted to draw, since we're talking, you know, uh, since Dan mentioned the stage directions, I just wanted to draw uh, our attention again to that wonderful line, walks off in a meditating posture. And uh, I just, yeah, it's, I did not expect to see that in there, but yeah. Mm. Uh, some of the, uh, yes, yeah, stage, uh, the stage directions uh, may be interpolated uh, uh, otherwise. Um, so the, just that might not be the authentic voice of Ben Johnson there, but um, one hopes it is. The, the way it's phrased suggests it is, but it might not be. And of course, depends on which which edition. Anyway, we are very much uh, over extra time. Uh, any final thoughts to throw in, uh, Rachel? Yeah, um, uh, I was just going to say it is kind of like Marston. And I know that Marston kind of does take, uh, I guess, influence from Ben Johnson. But uh, I, don't, I don't know if other people f felt this way, but the how people were saying that he ins how, how you just said he um inserted himself in all these characters and now other people are saying he inserted themselves in these other characters and muddied it that's what i got the the feeling of is that some of these characters that they're marston when he was drawing his characters and his character study that there's seemed like there was more difference between them even as they're playing these posh people in this mockery of these posh people and um, the Johnson's like, I feel like some of them could get like switched around or something like that, that there's, even if they have these different things that the way they're speaking is so similar and their perspective seems so similar that it becomes um, more like some of the dialogues or things that we've read in the evenings to me, or that was my impression of today, having read. Okay. Uh, well, uh, that, that's all we have time for. We've we've gone over time, and we've tried to cram too much in. 
uh, into one session. But um, uh, the, I'm sure there'll be more uh, grist of the mill further on uh, down the line as we may pick up on some odds and ends uh, from this uh, in, in future sessions. All that remains is thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye. Keep the cat safe. <laughs>